whether it's increasing natural gas production in the U.S. or extending the debate on nuclear energy or exactly, you know, how we should expand renewable energies, um, all of these energy sources have an environmental consequence and they all have uh, choices and trade-offs to be made. What's interesting is that almost all citizens, particularly in the developing world now, expect a certain amount of due diligence on the part of their government um, and even companies um, in, the, in the standing up of new energy sources. And this due diligence usually involves uh, considering a wide variety of sometimes very complex issues, um, ranging from environmental impact to visual impact to watershed impact to uh, health and safety um, and, and carbon footprint and many other issues. The Argonne Lab, of course, is focused on energy and we're very fortunate to have the Environmental Sciences Division at Argonne that over many years has made it its business uh, to understand how environmental systems are impacted by large-scale energy projects. Um, EVS operates uh, a large activity, has about uh, 90 full-time staffers and postdocs and over 100 STAs and temporary people. And they have a scientific, engineering, and kind of economic focus. So they're, in some sense, a, a, a one-stop shop for where environmental analysis can be done uh, for a wide range of environmental or of uh, energy technologies um, and looking at a wide variety of environmental uh, uh, impacts from these energy technologies. This, uh, these studies that EVS produces, the knowledge that they generate, uh, the questions that they ask and the questions that they answer are all used ultimately by policymakers, whether they're federal policymakers or whether they're companies that have to uh, internally <coughs> adjust their plans based on the analysis that EVS does on the environmental uh, impact, um, the, this information is used in making decisions and they impact, these decisions impact not just individual companies but it will impact uh, our quality of life uh, in, this, in this country and, and beyond this country. EVS also does more fundamental science. They operate two uh, facilities for the Office of Science uh, Biological and Environmental Research Office. One of those is the Southern Great Plains Atmospheric Radiation Monitoring Facility. Um, and the other one is the R Mobile Facility, too, which they also designed a few years ago and have deployed it now in a few interesting places. I think, it, is it back from the ship yet? Uh, it's in dry dock. In dry dock. It's been, it's probably gone to Hawaii more times than those of us in this lab. Um, I'm very happy to have John here. John's going to give the talk. Uh, John uh, is the director of EVS. Um, he's a... Uh, very well qualified to lead this division. John has a, a research background in landscape and ecosystems ecology, so he's an ecologist, which means that he sees the he sees the forest before he sees the trees. He sees the part he sees the parts and the connections between the parts. Um, but he also led uh, strategic activities here at Argonne in developing geographical information systems and applied that to environmental mon uh, modeling. And he's also been very active in building programs in the energy environment, uh, sort of nexus uh, and uh, stewardship related issues. I think it's fair to say that the kinds of things EVS does, the focus on GIS, the focus on in, uh, information integration, bringing together the research and the policy questions, the science questions, the engineering questions, the economic questions, is only gonna become more important as we go forward. I mean, there's new energy uh, sources like you know fracking uh, or mechanisms to produce uh, natural gas like fracking that have very complex environmental and maybe social issues associated with them and that kind of technology while it's very positive in, in increasing energy supply is also very complex from a, a what should the government you know do about it standpoint things like that are where uh, EVS excels in, in uh, doing the analysis doing the data collection and providing sort of a neutral uh, place in which this work can be done. And this kind of neutrality um, is really critical. Uh, I think EVS has, uh, has a world-class reputation of being a neutral party in analyzing these issues, which means they're very popular among their sponsors. They have many, many sponsors, something I know that John that drives uh, 
Dave a little crazy with all the different sources of revenue. But in any case, uh, I'm very glad that John's here, and uh, next time he won't write me such a long introduction. Uh, <laughs> so welcome, John. Yes. Thanks. Well, thanks, Rick. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll keep it shorter next time. Um, so. Uh, so we can move forward. Well, it's my pleasure to be here. I'm uh, happy to see many faces in the audience. Um, and I hope the presentation today gives you an idea of what we do in EVS, covers uh, a broad range of activities, and um, let's get on with the show. The, the required introductory slide, um, which Rick also went over. Um, I thought maybe, you know, to set the stage, it's nice, you know, kind of a zen moment to, to look at what NASA calls the blue marble, um, get, a, get, a, get an image of why we're here, why we want to do what we're doing, um, and not just EVS, but I think the whole laboratory always has this in the back of their mind. You know, it's one system, um, it's a set of physical and biological systems connected, and, and as scientists, um, we want to understand these systems because we want to leave an Earth system for our children and grandchildren that is functional and um, provides a, a nice place to live. So with that, let's go on to what I'm talking about in my talk today. Um, the idea of connecting models to measurements I think is fundamental in um, what we do in EVS. And this little video put together shows how we develop equations to describe Earth processes and we develop data that measures and assists in those forecasts. So the theme of my talk is really measurement and forecasting and how it's used in our program areas and how we um, are moving forward in this direction. So what we do and who we are. Well, the Environmental Science Division really conducts basic and applied research that seeks to understand how environmental systems function, and both in the natural and human-managed environments. Um, we need to know that because we're very concerned about how they respond to perturbations. Um, that's what I think all of us um, are focused on. So studying the interactions between energy systems and environmental systems really defines our role in the DOE National Laboratory Complex. And that role has been going on for uh, many decades now. Um, and it really, I think, um, solidifies um, our role as well as other labs in terms of environmental sciences in the DOE complex. Um, Rick mentioned um, we operate two significant user facilities for the U.S. Department of Energy, um, the Southern Great Plains Atmospheric Radiation Measurement site um, that Doug Sisterson uh, manages, and the ARM Mobile Facility 2 um, that is a mobile facility, and I'll talk about both of those in a little more detail. Um, because environment cuts across a wide range of economic, social, and scientific arenas, um, the disciplinary skills in our division are, are, are um, widespread and in-depth in many of these um, uh, disciplines that I list here. Um, atmospheric sciences, of course, numerical modeling, ecology, hydrology, health physics, chemistry, software engineering, civil and environmental engineering, geology. We have archaeologists, uh, economics, law, policy. Uh, many of us um, focus on geospatial analysis and database management. We really, I, I think if we went to a university to recruit We'd, we'd walk into just about every department in the university to seek candidates. Um, maybe not physicists, but who knows. Um, so just a little bit of background, um, kind of how the Environmental Sciences Division and Argonne's uh, environmental programs evolved over the years. Um, and I wanted to say, you know, it really started up in the 1970s, but um, Rich Coulter reminded me in a presentation a while back that Argonne has been collecting 
um, an uninterrupted atmospheric measurement activity for much longer than the 1970s. I think it dates back into the 1950s. So if you want to consider that, uh, the environmental footprint at Argonne starts from almost the early days of the laboratory. So in the 70s, we had clean water protection and NEPA as new activities that started to drive uh, the environmental programs at Argonne. And yes, in the 70s, Argonne did have a fleet um, that sailed the Great Lakes. Uh, in the 80s, um, acid rain and clean air became a, quite a priority, and we developed um, a lot of expertise and technologies in those areas. Also, ecosystem science and re risk analysis, I think, became a significant activity across the complex. And then in the 1990s, all of us know, we all lived through that period where um, the DOE complex and the DOD complex underwent a significant cleanup activity from, uh, from weapons productions primarily. And that drove a lot of activities across the DOE complex including argon and a lot of tools and, and um, science was developed out of that activity from, uh, from the laboratory system. And then where we are now, climate change, um, the Energy Policy Act uh, under the Bush administration has driven a lot of new activities. Uh, the, the increasing push for renewable act, uh, energy is, uh, it has become important and uh, an increasing focus on Earth, Earth systems modeling. So I mentioned earlier, EVS has a long history of conducting programmatic assessments. Um, we're, I think we're probably the best known within the DOE complex for, for big environmental programmatic assessments. We've, um, we've looked at significant um, issues related to wind energy uh, to support the Bureau of Land Management out west, um, a very large project. Uh, we've looked at siting energy corridors in the west for the Department of Energy, BLM, and the Forest Service, um, which ended up being, um, which is this activity here, ended up designating over 6,000 miles of energy corridor in the west, which is, if one thinks that it takes 10 years to put in a transmission line, was a significant activity. We've looked at oil shale and tar sands, offshore energy, and recently we've completed a very large activity for the Department of Energy and the Bureau of Land Management looking at siting solar energy development in, west, in the western federal land system. Um, that project um, I'll talk a little bit more about later. Um, our organization. I became division director about 17 months ago and of course as a new division director, I reorganized the division, which um, I read about in, uh, in, I think, the business section of the Tribune a few years back. Everybody should do that. So uh, our new organization is fairly flat, um, but significantly it has five major program areas. Bob Johnson, Environmental Security, Rao Kotamarthi, Atmospheric Science and Climate Research, Kirk Lagore, Ecological Resources and Systems, Mary Peisel, Radiation and Chemical Risk Management, and Karen Smith, Land and Renewable Energy Resources. Um, within that, we've organized the division into 19 smaller teams um, because it's my belief that creative work happens when a small number of individuals get together with like-minded interests. And so it's my hope and expectation that these smaller teams become the skunk work operations of the division to move us forward in some priority areas. So um, all of these teams fall under the, the five program areas. In addition, we have a couple of important strategic areas, John Gasper, Emerging Energy Technologies, and I'll talk a little bit more about the Center for Geospatial Analysis, which I am now acting head, but hope to soon uh, have a more permanent spot for that. Um, so let me talk a little bit about our program areas. Atmospheric science and climate research, an important activity for us, really blends measurement and modeling capabilities, the ARM capabilities and the climate research capabilities together under one, um, one roof. Um, we support the Office of Science, but we also support other federal agencies. Land and renewable resources, it's an important area for us. Um, a lot of the activities we look at um, have to address effects on large land areas and how those um, land areas may change over time. 
That's an important activity. Radiation and chemical risk management um, that Mary Peisel runs. This has got a long, uh, important history within our division. And really, we're looking at assessing and managing risks associated with nuclear and chemical materials and waste. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. And then environmental security and restoration. Um, we have a growing and important activity looking at environmental activities related to national and homeland security. And I believe our division is probably the most important contributor to the SCIF, the, um, the um, access controlled area at the laboratory where um, um, secure activities can be addressed. And one of the areas that is growing is our geospatial analysis attract that's a, attached to national security. So um, in addition, um, Bob's area looks at um, uh, characterizing and restoring sites contaminated with hazardous materials, and I'll talk a little bit more in detail about that. Finally, and not, but not least, is the Ecological Resources and Systems uh, program managed by Kirk Liguori. Um, it's, a, it's a large program with ecologists, hydrologists, geologists, and modelers um, looking at ecological systems at many different scales. So, um, I thought it would be of interest to poll the staff and ask where we've all been in the last few years in terms of our footprint on the globe. And as you can see, it's fairly extensive. Um, I think it covers all continents. We did go down to Antarctica about 20 years ago, but that's not included. But our, and, and these are boots on the ground. These aren't just locations that we studied. So um, we've covered a vast uh, array of projects um, of critical importance to the United States and other countries. For example, in the former Soviet Union republics, we've uh, been instrumental in the transparency program, which um, monitors and evaluates the movement of weapons grade material into civilian reactor fuels. Um, of course, we've been heavily involved in the U.S. Uh, we've, we've done a lot of work in Alaska. In fact, if anybody wants to know anything about Alaska, any little nook and cranny, come and see me or, or a couple of uh, others of us who have been just about everywhere in the state at almost any time during the year, um, including uh, Point Barrow in January. Um, so we've done a lot of work across the, the world, and um, it, it's all been of a great interest to us. What I want to address now is what I think is a cohesive theme within EVS. And the video I had earlier mentioned that. It's the connection between measurement and modeling. I think all of our program areas are developing significant um, programmatic direction that really is looking at what I call forecasting um, the future, which in the environmental business everybody wants to know. What, if I do this, or this happens, or this scenario is, is projected to occur, what will the environment look like? Um, it's the number one question that everybody has. And so modeling and forecasting future conditions is, is a key component of what we do in our division. And you really can't model without effectively developing measurement techniques to support the modeling activity. And I want to focus quite a bit on, on some of those measurement activities that we do in the division that essentially, I hope, over time, become more and more embedded in our forecasting operations so that we have, a, a, I think, become well known for our measurement modeling integration activities. And so what I want to do is cover five examples, one from each program area. And with a special emphasis on the geospatial analysis and data that's embedded throughout the programs in EVS. Um, and as I do that, I, I, I want to talk a little bit about where we're headed, our future state. So these are the puzzle pieces. Um, we're trying to put them together. It's an ongoing activity. First of all, let me um, address our climate uh, science program. Uh, fundamentally, our climate science program addresses radiative forcing. Um, the sun's energy striking the earth and the radiation energy that leaves the earth and the balance that is achieved, um, which controls the climate systems in the earth. Um, this is from the uh, IPCC 
um, AR4 report, and it shows some of the, um, well, CO2, methane, the forcing gases, the forcing aerosols, the clouds. There's a lot of force activity related to that. Our niche is becoming this area right here, aerosols and clouds. There's, the, um, there's a lot of uncertainty related to these and how they might affect future climate um, and future weather. Um, it's a hot area of activity and research. Um, here I just show on this slide, um, you can see the forcing from CO2, but most recently black carbon and now brown carbon, um, which, is, which absorbs heat, is becoming an increasingly active area of research um, because the uncertainty related to that is very high and reducing the uncertainty will help us better project what future climates may be across the globe. So, our key program in doing that is our atmospheric radiation measurement program. And as I mentioned earlier, we run two facilities for the Department of Energy Office of Science. Um, initially, it was set up to, um, to do very basic measurements of radiation flux. And it's done an excellent job uh, reducing the uncertainty um, on clear days. And this is primarily focused on the Southern Great Plains site, which is the, our premier DOE site. Um, cloudy days and clouds become more uncertain in the measurements and, and therefore affect the modeling capability. So right now I'd say ARM is becoming more and more focused on clouds and aerosols because that's the important science question we have now. So if you just look at what, what ARM would do, if you take this, this instrument that measures um, the IR portion of the, the spectrum, an ARM campaign essentially reduced the residuals significantly from uh, before the campaign to after the campaign. In fact, now the residuals are less than a few percent, which is what ARM seeks to achieve over the long term, is reduce the uncertainty of, of uh, key parameters that are fundamental to climate modeling. And right now, for example, Maria Kedidu and others are focused on uh, improving the microwave portion of the atmospheric radiative transfer um, component of radiative forcing. So let me talk a little bit about the Southern Great Plains site. And um, I, hope, I hope I don't put my foot in my mouth because I know Doug is here and he'll be uh, He'll be coming after me if I misspeak anywhere. So, Doug, just keep quiet till the end of the talk. Um, the initial layout of, of the Southern Great Plains site, which, which really is, you know, it, it, you know, that's just not me and that's just not the rest of EVS. It is the premier fundamental arm location for DOE. It's by far has the most money invested in it. In the initial setup from 1990 to 2010, um, it had a footprint of 325 by 275 kilometers. Uh, an array of instruments were set up. This projector is good enough that I think you can even read um, the types of information that was collected at the site. Um, as Doug and others would say, there's a lot of soda straw uh, measurements conducted, which basically look up to the troposphere and back down, or, or look down and up, or back and forth here and there, wherever. And so, um, uh, through this long-term collection of measurements, my earlier graph showed how we've come to understand the radiative forcing, which is the common currency of climate models um, that can be, they're interpreted within a climate model to come up with the temperature issues that, or the precipitation issues that everyone is most concerned about. So this was the, this was the, the prior footprint. And I'll look at my notes. Um, we have, the, we have um, for example, uh, facilities on site that calibrate instruments. We have microwave radiometers. We have, um, shoot, what is that, Doug? Thank you. And what's that one again? Broadband. Broad, broadband. So we have two radiometers here. I, my notes are buried here. I apologize. And, uh, but significantly, and thanks to the stimulus funding, the ARM site has gone under a, a fairly significant transformation to modernize it 
to collect data that's of, of interest to folks um, in the climate research community now. It, this, the footprint became smaller, but uh, most importantly, um, a number of new radars and new instruments were brought to the site. So the focus now is to collect a more regional um, synoptic in, in long-term view of clouds and aerosols and clear days throughout this large site, here's Tulsa, um, that's instrumented with kind of the central facility but also significant instruments located um, on the periphery. So we're, we're much more interested in, in a regional mix of the measurements, not so much the soda straw, and uh, an increase in 3D. I think the, the, big, the big activity we're looking at now is radars and radar issues uh, related to um, collecting data for climate. Um, I, radars are, are a growing area in the ARM program. Um, they're very effective in, I'd call it, meteorological forecasting. Our challenge is to look at radars and how they best can be used in climate and regional climate modeling. And no one has really done that. They haven't been used that way before, and we're growing our program in that area because hopefully that adds a significant amount of new information for climate modeling. Um, probably the one uh, new ARM facility that's got a lot of notoriety recently is the ARM Mobile Facility 2. Um, that was built at Argonne um, and comes back to Argonne um, after campaigns are completed. The mobile facility component of it means that DOE asks for calls for proposals. Those calls are peer reviewed and the um, winning proposal or team gets to put the R mobile facility in a different location to study, study different phenomena. So initially when, when it was first completed, it was put out at Steamboat Springs, Colorado, up on the mountaintop by the ski resort for its initial test run. It was then moved to Ghan and the Maldives um, for, a, for a period of time. The interesting story there is during the later part of the deployment, there was a coup on the island. And so uh, we learned how to um, disassemble and move um, our complete equipment under the cover of darkness while a coup was going on and everybody in DOE was extremely worried. But uh, we got out safe, uh, no one was hurt, and the equipment arrived back at Argonne in good condition. But fundamentally, this, this um, piece of uh, equipment, set of equipment, you can see the inside of some of the containers. Um, and here is something that uh, Rich Coulter and Tim um, worked on quite a bit was the roll, pitch, and heading stabilizing platform uh, for putting the uh, equipment on a ship. And that's where it is right now. It's on the uh, Horizon Spirit, a commercial ship that's sailing between Los Angeles and Honolulu, collecting information. Um, important for this campaign is the, trans is the kind of the cloud transition between the um, Los Angeles area and the Hawaiian Islands where you go from marine layer clouds to more uh, kind of uh, more structured cumulus, cumulus nimbus clouds. Uh, these transitions and these cloud types are very important in terms of collecting data for climate models. Not much is known about those. It's a, it's a high level of uncertainty that could uh, affect um, our projections of temperature. Um, as part of our ARM program, we have instrument mentors. Our, our instrument mentors at Argonne um, take care of a key instrument um, within the DOE program, and their idea is to translate data from that instrument, <coughs> assure the data is high quality, uh, perhaps transform the data into something more useful to modelers, all sorts of key activities throughout the, really for our global user base. So I just put up a few examples here. Um, we've developed a new algorithm to retrieve uh, planetary boundary layer heights um, from some of our instrumentation. Um, maybe you weather geeks know that at night the low level jet be, comes, you know, very close to the surface, maybe 300 meters, 500 meters from the surface. And then during the day, mixing occurs and it disappears. Um, that's what this graph shows. 
We've got a new algorithm to look at marine boundary layer um, aerosol depths, um, new algorithms to retrieve 3D wind fields from storms and radar data sets. Like I said, our radar program is growing. Um, the amount of information coming out of it is significant. It's complex. It's hard to do. We hope to make that bridge to the uh, climate modeling community where it's currently located. I'd say it's in the weather forecasting community. So a lot of activity there. Um, Yan Fang and Rao Kotamarthi um, recently published a paper that I think will put us in <coughs> uh, good condition for uh, seeking more funds from DOE. And this, this paper looked at um, brown carbon. I earlier mentioned black carbon, but brown carbon is, uh, it's always been out there, but now um, it's become apparent that it's a very important contributor to uh, global warming. It is, it is an aerosol that absorbs heat, um, and you can see in this graph is a significant uh, component of primarily biomass burning, conventional fuel burning. You can see in the, in the tropics in Africa and Asia, <coughs> it, has a, it, it has a significant impact on, on the, the radiative uh, forcing in, in that part of the globe. And here, this picture, we just show how we're also looking very much at aerosols and their effects on climate. Um, the bottom line from this is we are, we are trying to formulate at Argonne um, a program that, that addresses aerosols and brown carbon, go to DOE, and grow this as a modeling measurement activity within, uh, within EVS. And uh, we'll be heading to DOE the end of March to make a fairly significant presentation to the Office of Science, BER, in terms of this program and how we might formulate um, uh, future work. Um, and then finally under this, um, regional climate change modeling. <coughs> Excuse me, fighting a cold here. Um, this is, um, this is where the rubber hits the road. This is what everybody wants. Everybody wants climate models that downscale to where, um, where we can start seeing things happen on a landscape that we're really interested in terms of climate adaptation and effects on resources and policy and all those other things. Um, it will be a growth area. Um, We've got, a, we've got a, a, what I think is a significant new program from CERDIP, which is a um, science program uh, organized by DOD, DOE, and EPA um, that's looking at regional climate change modeling. Um, it's taking a regional climate model, the nested regional climate model embedded in a global model to downscale. And importantly, um, Rao and his postdocs and others are looking at the connection between the models and observations that control the models. And it's, it's become very important that a model alone without very, very good observation measurement data is, is the, not very good. The measurement data is required. Um, here, if you, and we'll call that nudging, let's say. Um, here, without nudging, the root mean square area, error, I'm sorry, um, is fairly significant with nudging. Um, adding measurement data to the model, we greatly reduce that. And in talking to Rao, just simple things, you know, very kind of straightforward measurements like the radiosons that are launched throughout the United States. There are about, what, 80 of them, Rao, or so? <coughs> just, just adding that daily set of, of, of measurements to these models greatly improves their, their ability to forecast. And, um, but I think fundamentally the regional models, um, the uh, Western Governors Association had, a, um, had a, uh, a meeting where they were looking at regional modeling and, and regional climate modeling and what it could do in the West because there's great concern about temperature and precipitation issues in the West. The fundamental uh, conclusion is the regional models are getting better. They point to maybe hot spots or, or issues to look at but they're not really there as far as um, um, a trusted um, result. So this will be an active area of research uh, for our division. 
Now moving on to a different program, and I talked a little bit about our land and land resource program, and I, want you, I wanted to mention one of the activities that came out of our, our solar energy work, and that's um, we, have a, we have over a million dollars to do measurement and monitoring of these potential solar energy facilities in the western U.S. And our first goal is to really look at uh, hydrologic impacts um, to see if the forecasts of what these large um, solar arrays do on the, the, the surface and subsurface hydrology come true. So the idea is to develop measuring and monitoring techniques that are cost effective but useful in determining um, what the system dynamics are. So it's really, that's our first focus, it's just started up. <coughs> We're now uh, in the process of developing methodologies. Uh, Yuki Hamada and Van O'Connor are working on this project, um, incorporating uh, um, a set of, um, uh, now, now when we talk about remote sensing here, it's the, the type that kind of most people think about, the satellites in, the, in those activities looking at the ground, whereas the ARM program thinks of remote sensing as looking at the atmosphere. So, this is kind of ground-based remote sensing. But the idea is to use hyperspectral data uh, sources, actually a number of sources, put them together in a, what we'd call a hyperspectral data cube, so you can evaluate multiple environmental characteristics during one campaign of data collection. And like I said, our initial focus is on hydrologic issues, uh, we hope to move the work forward in ecological uh, habitats and communities. And, um, and really, I think it's our opportunity for the first time where, where these agencies have realized they need to do um, long-term measurements and they need to develop protocols that we're in at the ground floor. And I believe we have enough money to do it right. So um, I think we're going to see some important results come out of this. And just to give a quick overview of, of what that might look like, and actually, there was a campaign November 12th and the 13th of last year. You have an aircraft flying over. You have the reflectance of the sun off the Earth's surface being captured by the uh, hyperspectral and DEM data collection activity in the airplane. And in this case, we're looking at um, the Riverside East Solar Energy Zone, which is a Bureau of Land Management area. Just to give you a picture of what it looks like, um, it's a highly arid environment, but has significant ecological features. And so we're trying to capture as many sorts of observations and measurements as we can from a single campaign. So let me, let me show you a little bit about that. Um, that campaign, I won't go into remote sensing and what it does, but I'll just go to the fact that uh, with these sensors and at the wavelengths that they capture uh, um, energy from, you can, you can distinguish, for example, um, here is an ironwood tree. Based on its structure, height, and greenness, it, it, it reflects at the, about the 725 nanometer range. In this, uh, you have creosote bush. It reflects at about the 550 nanometer range. Um, this you have a yellow flower, how's that for a scientific description, that reflects at about the 600 to 650 range. The point being that if you go in the field and capture what I'd call a library of signatures, and you know what those are, and you have that data in, um, in, in your back pocket with field verification, then you can connect these large synoptic views and start treating all of this as real data. And significantly for us, um, because of changes in the West in, in soil structure and, and reflectance, you can even look at very sort of what I call microscopic or micro level hydrologic features that can be used to look at very, very um, subtle hydrologic processes on the landscape. So this is the system um, that's initially proposed. Um, and I don't want to go into all of this, but the idea is um, a data collection operation can collect the number of significant um, pieces of information that feed into a number of uh, 
significant needs for our measurement and modeling activities, including hydrologic processes, um, for example, surface elevation. We can look at changes in soil surface property, changes the riparian vegetation. Um, it's important for us to get um, good characteristics on soil and surface elevations because there are very subtle but important hydrologic processes going on in these desert landscapes that are important to the long-term stability of these landscapes. And so this type of information will uh, greatly assist us and the agencies in measuring that over time. Now to move on to another program area that um, again connects measurement and modeling. Um, we've been working a very, very long time and we are the, I'd say the environmental um, um, operation for the Western Area Power Administration. We've been working for them for over 25 years. Um, well, maybe that's not quite right, but 20 years. Um, for a lot of different purposes, the Environmental Science Division and DIS have been working together to support Western on a lot of their hydropower activities related to the Upper Colorado River. DIS has developed some uh, significant modeling capability that looks at um, um, optimizing the use of hydroelectric electricity in the grid. And we, EVS, have been focusing on um, looking at how best to manage flows out of these facilities to be protective of river systems. Um, and we've been doing this for quite a long while. We've been collecting data. Um, here's Corey Weber, uh, John Hayes. We've been collecting data below uh, uh, a number of the facilities on the Upper Colorado River to develop um, models that look at um, fish populations in riparian areas in these rivers. Uh, and specifically, I just want to mention what we're doing at Flaming Gorge Reservoir. Uh, Flaming Gorge Dam is a, a large facility on the Green River, which is a significant um, tributary of the Colorado River. Um, and it's a 150 megawatt peaking facility, which means uh, when electricity is needed, primarily in the middle of the day, that's when the most value is achieved out of this facility, so it releases water to produce electricity. And as probably you know, or if you hadn't known, it's easy to understand, that flux of water becomes a standing wave as it moves down the river system. So you have a release of water from the facility in red, and then let's say at Jenison Gauge, which I'm not sure quite how far away that is. John, how far away is that gauge? Uh, 150 About 150 kilometers, you see that wave um, pass through Jenison Gauge based on the releases from Flaming Gorge Dam. It's those waves of water, those fluxes of water coming down the facilities, the, the, the river facilities um, um, downstream from the dam that cause a lot of environmental issues with riparian and fish populations and that's what we're concerned with. So what we've done for Western is we've done a couple of things. One is um, to develop an individual-based model of trout populations um, which inhabit the colder waters nearer the reservoir. And um, in these individual-based models, which really are agent-based models, if people are familiar with that, um, Kirk Ligori, John Hayes, and others, um, University of Utah has helped us, um, some folks out um, at UC Berkeley, and others have to put together these individual base models where each cell is, uh, is considered a kind of a habitat type, we'll call it, for, for fish. And the fish individuals then make decisions about which cell they use, where they want to go, and, and in, those, um, in those decisions that the fish make, we can calculate mortality, competition, growth, the condition of the fish, reproduction, and essentially do a very sophisticated modeling of, of fish populations in response to these um, river uh, fluctuations coming from the dam. And here's some data. It's hard to read. I won't go into excruciating detail over that. But if we look at the peaking percent of full, which has to do with 
with the limits of the dam and how much it is capable of being, of releasing and how much it does release, there is relationships, not so much in the trout, but the trout are cold water fish, so they actually like a flux of colder water being released from the dam and um, do less well when there are lower releases just because of water temperature and habitat. The, but of real concern and what drives our program are there are endangered species, uh, endangered fishes in the Colorado River. Uh, why is that? Well, the Colorado River and its tributaries like the Green River, before they were dammed, were uh, much more tranquil, uh, warmer environments for fish species. Uh, when the dams were put in, the water flow changed, the temperature changed, <coughs> and the endangered species were essentially uh, hanging on in various refugia that still mimicked historical river conditions. And that's uh, one of the issues we're looking at in terms of uh, long-term sustainability of, of these fisher, fishery populations in these warm water conditions. So uh, the Colorado pike minnow is one of these uh, fish species that we're modeling. Uh, again, individual-based models, but focus very much on backwater conditions. And these backwater conditions are really refugees uh, or refugia for fish when the mainstream is, uh, is experiencing the fluctuating flows. So the idea is we have to be very careful in terms of monitoring and maintaining these backwater conditions. And let me just run a little video here. Um, you can see how this backwater changes as flows increase over time and how they go back to, uh, to a low flow condition as these waves of, uh, of water come from the a facility as it releases water for electricity production. So let me... So we've spent a lot of time and energy measuring these, monitoring these, and modeling the fish populations. And here you can see on this graph, uh, under the maximum daily stage change, um, the response of growth to various insect densities. I think these are number of insects per square meter on the river bottom. Um, basically what it says is under very low flows, warmer water, protected backwaters, these fish do very well. They, they struggle a bit as flows increase and fluctuations increase. So um, the takeaway from this is Western and the Bureau of Reclamation have fundamentally altered their um, dam operations to be more protective of these habitats so that these species have a higher probability of surviving in the long term in the Colorado River system. So um, based on what Western was doing 20 years ago and the Bureau of Reclamation was doing 20 years ago to what they're doing today is actually significantly different because of the work that Argonne has done along with other researchers working on these river systems. So I think we've had a significant impact in terms of making these very large and important electricity producing operations more environmentally friendly and um, trying as best we can to mimic the natural river system, even though these uh, fluxes of water are necessary to produce electricity. So a very important program. It's an ongoing program. Um, we're really, um, we are the environmental support um, scientists for the Western um, uh, Colorado River Basin. Um, the other program area I wanted to talk about was our, um, our cleanup program. Um, it has a long history at Argonne. Um, in fact, we still do a very significant um, activity for the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and these are our trucks that show up at facilities. Um, traditionally, data collection has been very expensive when you go to a contaminated site. Um, there's a lot of analysis, a lot of data collection, and it becomes multi-millions of dollars to just determine the extent of the contamination and the location of the contamination. This has been a, an important problem throughout the process. And we, I think, have been fundamental 
in, over the years in altering how uh, restoration and cleanup activities have taken place. Um, Bob Johnson, Lisa Durham, um, folks at the EPA, um, several universities have been working together to develop, in the early days, uh, we called it ASAP. Um, uh, let's see, now I have to get the acronym right. Um, it's an adaptive sampling and analysis program. And basically, what Bob was key in doing in leading the activity was combining Bayesian statistics with geospatial analysis to come up with a set of techniques <coughs> that would sample a contaminated area in a way that would, A, greatly reduce the number of samples required to uh, describe and determine the, the characteristics and the potential areas needed for cleanup, um, and do it in a very kind of uh, well-accepted and robust manner. And as this clicked through, you could see that the uncertainty of the data collection and sampling activity decreased, and the sites that were marked clean versus dirty um, merged on uh, a very well-known outcome. So over time that would occur. Now, I, I think, you know, this, this, this has gotten a lot of credit. It deserves more credit. Um, if you go to the EPA website, their triad website, where they direct all of their um, kind of uh, folks interested in cleaning up contamination, uh, if you go to that website and you look at the triad program, right there in the front you'll see that most of that is based on Argonne's work in some of our significant early cleanups using techniques just like this, which involve um, a, a much more efficient data collection activity. Um, and because of that, we've become quite uh, proficient and experts at um, putting together all of the information required for uh, data acquisition in, in uh, cleanup activities using databases, uh, real-time data acquisition and communication, um, state-of-the-art sensors, incorporating image analysis, and importantly, because a lot of these sites are connected to folks all over the U.S., um, porting and putting the data into websites where real-time data can be looked at, um, uh, data fusion activities can occur, so a number of people can work on the same program and project within a web-based platform. So where does that lead us in this program? Well, you know, one of the things we did in EVS is form one of the teams I talked about um, has formed around this idea of bringing software and data and sensors together in this arena of restoration and cleanup, but, but also to uh, expand it to look at new innovative areas that we can move into, including 4D characterization, smart collaborative data collection systems, citizen sensors, crowdsource information, adaptive self-assembling data acquisition networks, uh, moving a lot of some of this activity to high-performance computing, um, to do real-time data analysis. So we feel that because of technology and because of, um, I think, the increased acceptance of this technology, um, there's plenty of room for growth. And then the final program area I wanted to cover was, um, was our, our cleanup, our RAD and CHEM cleanup activities. And our significant program in there is ResRAD. Um, ResRAD is an actual code um, that's been designated within DOE and by NRC to be used in terms of risk analysis for uh, RAD um, waste in site cleanup. It's been um, in use for more than 25 years, and I don't know if there's many activities within the national lab system related to software and modeling that have been codified by DOE and um, accepted for over 25 years. And it's been through uh, very, very robust um, uh, validation exercises. Uh, Charlie Yu has hauled the code to Ven uh, Vienna to compete against other international codes, we consistently come out on top um, in, you know, in the code competition. Um, and um, we've held many, many training workshops. It's got international recognition. In fact, we're now receiving money to turn, uh, turn the code into a multilingual version um, to be more um, 
useful to uh, our global user base. Um, like any good monopoly, we've expanded the code in, in a number of different areas, um, all based on the same fundamental philosophy and, and drivers. And our ResRad team is made up of health physicists, chemists, uh, software engineers, database engineers. Um, so it's a, it's a kind of a robust team of scientists, engineers, and computer scientists. Um, I think if I wanted to talk about where the future is, it's in ResRad offsite and in, not so much in the U.S., but in, in Europe and in, in parts of Asia, there's a real, real comeback of what we'd call radiobiology, which in, is kind of the early days of biology in the national lab systems was looking at, you know, radioisotopes and their movement in the environment and their uptake in the environment. So this could be a growth area. Um, these other uh, codes, uh, some are a little bit older than others, but I think we're, we're looking at these as potential growth areas for us. Um, just a quick glance, one of the more current updates to ResRad is to import better geospatial data into the model so that individuals using it can put their site up or their location and start placing various activities on the map and then running the model. And I just had Charlie um, um, upload some, some of the groundwater modeling um, uh, information behind it. Although I will say that one of our goals in, in the ResRad um, area is to, uh, in, is to link ResRad to a much better uh, geo-hydrologic uh, model. And finally, ResRad does a bunch of probabilistic models um, or outputs that are important to our, our user base because all of these things related to the uptake and um, movement of radioactive material in the environment have a high level of uncertainty. And so um, there's been a lot of work adding probabilistic um, activities to the model. Um, so let me catch up. And um, let me just say that ResRad was used in the Fukushima event, looked at rice, we looked at seafood consumption, and also riding the bullet train uh, through, through the part of Japan affected by the Fukushima incident. So it, it has been used in Fukushima by a number of individuals. Um, and then last but not least, I think this is kind of an interesting fact for, for all of us um, in EVS. ResRad conducts training activities, and the training activity that occurred last summer um, had participants from five continents, just to show you um, how widespread this code is in terms of its use around the globe. Um, and here are, the, here are the participants at the course, but they came from South America, Africa, Europe, Australia, and Asia, and North America. Um, it's a significant user base, and um, we continue to uh, attract a number of uh, people coming to Argon to be trained in the code. And now, um, let me just talk a little bit about our initiatives, where we're going as a division. Um, right now, we have four what I consider strategic initiatives, and that is to move forward in our, in our environmental modeling and quantitative integrative assessment work out of our NEPA work, um, a heavy focus on developing and promoting our geospatial analysis activities, um, looking at the climate land interface. Um, we do a lot of work in the climate arena. I think we, there's definitely potential for growth in climate adaptation studies, in ecosystem functions, working with bio, working with others. And, um, and then last but not least, the big kahuna on the agenda is um, to develop an environmental field facility. Let me just skip through that. Um, one area that I'm really excited about, and I, and I hope that we can grow this and become even more well-known within the laboratory and in university structures, the Center for Geospatial Analysis. Um, we do a lot of work in geospatial work. We work with a lot of other divisions at Argonne. We work with a lot of collaborators at universities that have a common theme of geospatial analysis. And I think by developing this center, we bring together those folks under this common theme 
and I can only see good things happening from our folks that use GIS, our climate modelers, our soil scientists, um, our groundwater work, our database work. It, I think we're going to see good things happen out of collaborations in that area. Um, and I think we're almost there in terms of where I would like to see argon grow, and that's in um, sensor arrays deployed in the environment. And with high performance computing, the new development in sensors, the, the robustness, the, the cost, the types of information they collect. This, this slide is from a LDRD proposal that was prepared last year. I still think it's a great proposal. Didn't get funded. Rick, others. Um, it's a, I think uh, it's still well worth considering. You probably see it every year until it does get funded. Um, but uh, just an idea of, of where we can go with sensors, what they can do in the environment, and how, how important it is, I think, to look at our high performance computing and how it might be configured to look at real time data analysis and real time data storage, which is a little bit different than I think a lot of people um, in, think about high performance computing systems and their modeling um, activities. So I think this. We're going to hear more and more about this, you know, in all, not just Argonne, but all over the complex and at universities is, is sensor arrays and sensor networks. Here's the way I look at it. You know, doing environmental work is very costly. Going out in the field to collect data is very costly. It inhibits our ability to get a lot of what I consider significant experiments done and significant data collected. Just because it's, it's a lot of manual work, it, it, it's just, it's kind of just an old fashioned way of, of collecting data. If we can come up with better sensor networks embedded in, you know, good experimental designs that run a long time, that are sitting in the right environment and can be manipulated, we're going to see, I think, a renaissance in environmental science and the types of experiments and observations we can collect. Um, as these sensor networks become smarter and more targeted to very specific environmental parameters. So I think this is definitely the future. And then if you think big picture, I'm calling it, Rick knows this too, I call it the Wisconsin Initiative. And that, you know, maybe that's because I'm a cheesehead. But um, I call it the Wisconsin Initiative because um, the goal is to have an Argonne field site. Argonne needs for environmental science a place to go to do its experiments, to do studies, to do uh, big picture science. Um, we're a small facility. Yes, we have the 400 area with our atmospheric instrumentation, but we're hindered by not having what I think is a, a, a strong um, field location. And so why do I say Wisconsin? Um, it's to me, a location that's near, it has a lot of uh, public land, the Forest Service, uh, the state forests up in northern Wisconsin. In fact, uh, we're developing a memorandum of understanding with the Forest Service to uh, better connect Argonne with their science activities. Um, and it's, if you look closely, it's in, a, it's in a nice nexus for hydrologic issues, climate issues, and other activities that we think are important, or I think are important to DOE. So, um, you know, at the risk of having this show up on my performance appraisal every year and Rick asking me how is the Wisconsin initiative going, it's out there for everybody here to look at. Um, so, you know, I, I, I'm hoping to get buy-in. I think it's an exciting idea. Maybe not be in Wisconsin, maybe be somewhere else, but I think that the idea of, of Argonne developing uh, a field facility with state-of-the-art sensors, state-of-the-art networks connected to high-performance computing, and not just a measurement location, but an experimental location where we can manipulate the environment and do experiments. So we can, we can actually do real hardcore science at the site. Um, and I think that's why I'm focusing on Wisconsin, because there are locations there that are big enough and will allow manipulations to occur under current programs that, you know, right now that looks like a, a nice location to do that. 
So with that, I've kind of overrun my time. I thank you. I, uh, we do, uh, just as a closing um, set of remarks, we have 43 PIs in the division, so I only scratched the surface of some of the things we do. Um, and I don't mean to leave, leave anybody out, but I did want to give a flavor of, of the types of activities we do and where we're going and what I think will be an important initiatives for us in the next five to 10 years. So thank you very much. Okay, we have time for a few quick questions. Who wants to go to Wisconsin? I guess Matt, Matt does, there. all right. And I never have questions. Um, could you explain uh, or talk a little bit about uh, citizen sensors and citizen science and what you're doing, um, or if there are ongoing projects with the DOE to collect, to ask the public to collect information? Well, the, the whole idea of citizen sensors is related to, you know, smartphone technology. And um, at the last um, Argonne Open House, we had a little bit of a demonstration on that. Uh, it, you know, there's a lot of data being collected by smartphones. I mean, Facebook uploaded 1.3 billion pictures on New Year's Eve. Half of them were geotagged. So, I, you know, th that, that's kind of what we're talking about in citizen sensors. It's going to get them to take pictures of clouds. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So I, I, um, I wouldn't say there's, there's a complete program in that area, but it, it's an area that a lot of people are, are interested in. Um, we had a workshop on Homeland Security last year, and we'll have another one. There's, uh, there's a growing activity in, in using data that's in the public domain uh, that is just a, a mass of, of information related to what people are doing out there, how Twitter feeds are sent around, how things develop. So, you know, th that whole idea of random or not so random data collection by folks, you know, and their smartphones is is going to be an important area. Another question. There you go. Yeah, John. John, I was wondering about the the geospatial analysis program and uh, who are who are our competitors in that space and what uh, differenti differentiates Argon from our competitors. What unique capabilities do we bring? That's a that's a good question. Well, I, let me just uh, let me just cite one project. Uh, DIS and, and EVS are working on a, um, a, a data collection mapping program for the Office of Electricity. And that was a competitive proposal that we put in and the other labs competed, we won it. It's, it's essentially a big geospatial activity. The 39 states in the east are coming together to look at energy planning for the first time and we're building a a, a very, very large, sophisticated database for them to use for energy planning. We call it the easy mapping tool. And, um, and folks at the Office of Electricity have told me that, you know, Argonne is viewed as the energy database group for the Department of Energy now, especially for environmental uh, energy nexus problems. And we've put together, um, I think, a critical mass of data across the U.S for energy planning that gives us a huge leg up. And that's just one area. But we've also had a couple of strategic hires that the lab is funding that are focusing, one specifically, UMACON on geospatial analysis and soils. We had, our, we had a meeting where we asked everybody in the division to come together that had significant geospatial activities going on and about 25 people showed up. So, you know, it, it was, in some ways, it's a program development opportunity you know, why hide it everywhere? So if we have a center and we show what we're doing on our website, it attracts customers. But fundamentally, we're, I think we're becoming very well recognized in the field. Okay. One more quick question back here. Jiao, can you talk about uh, the, uh, I think it's called the Strategic Energy Center led by Jiao Gasper. Oh, that, that area, yes, John Gasper, uh, he's been at Argonne a long time. That, that area is, is focused on renewables and a lot of activities happening out in um, 
kind of the uh, OCS, the uh, Outer Continental Shelf in terms of energy development. We're working with uh, the Bureau of Ocean Energy um, uh, Management and um, the Bureau of Safety and Environmental Engineering, or Bessie and Bohm. They're the old uh, mineral management service um, to look at a lot of new uh, developing technologies on the Outer Continental Shelf, and John is heavily involved in that. So that's, I think, one of the most important areas that he's keeping track of. Okay, thanks, John. I think uh, we'll draw the session to a close. I think we'll, we have the posters oh, in the back posters and, and coffee. food, and we are going to have individuals at the posters, so please feel fee free to wander around and get a little bit more in-depth perspective on some of the activities we do.